Welcome back to Reset, session two. You know, as we look at this part of the storyline, we got to get our bearings in the Bible. Book of Joshua is one of the high points of the entire Old Testament. After Moses led the people out of Egypt, and then they end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. In Joshua, they finally cross the Jordan, and they have one victory after another. They actually go 31-1 and one in major battles in that book. But Joshua is followed by Judges, which has got to be one of the most depressing books in all the Bible, as God's people learn and forget the same lesson over and over and over for 400 years. We're going to look at the fourth of our Judges, and her name is Deborah, and we learn about her in chapters 4 and 5. But before that, we, we've got to look at, at what the situation is, what's going on. Uh, Judges 21-25, the last verse in the book, uh, explains why the people have had so much trouble in this book after the triumphs under Joshua. Judges 21-25 says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. You know, it's like you've gone through a ghost town out in the old west of our country. And you're like, obviously this was a thriving community. What happened that no one lives here anymore? And on the, on the far side of the town, there's a, there's a sign that explains, well, the gold rush came and went, or there was a plague hit the people. That's what this last verse is. The people are weak. There's no unified leadership. Everyone did as they saw fit. You know, aren't, aren't you glad you don't live in a culture like that? I mean, seriously, I'll bet back then they had to take a Gallup poll to decide if something was moral or immoral. There probably were a lot of conversations, well, that might be your truth, but my truth, which is equally valid to your truth, they'd lost any sense of objective truth, and that's why they're in trouble. So let's get started with the story, beginning in Judges chapter 4, verse 1. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Harosheth Hagoyim because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. They cried to the Lord for help. When Israel again rebels against God, he allows the Canaanites to oppress them. There's a pattern that we see over and over in the book. Moral weakness, spiritual compromise led to national vulnerability. And it happens again. Who's God going to raise up this time? Well, verse 4, Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. You see in these verses, Deborah serves as a prophet, a leader, and a judge. Any one of those would be impressive. But all three of those? Are you surprised? If so, you're not the only one. I'll tell you one person who would have been very surprised by this. Actually, it was there for the reading is Martin Luther, and we're not picking on Martin Luther because, again, great, great leader, great hero of the faith. But Martin Luther said this. He said, No gown worse becomes a woman than the desire to be wise. You you think of an essential quality of a judge, somebody who's going to settle disputes between people. I'm looking for wisdom more than anyone else. And Luther says that's an ill-fitting garment on a woman. Well, Deborah seemed to wear that real well. He also said, I'm not even sure what to do with this one. Men have broad and large chests and small, narrow hips and more understanding than women who have but small and narrow breasts and broad hips to the end that they should remain at home, sit still, keep house and bear and bring up children. Again, this clashes with 
the example of Deborah, this, this clashes with Proverbs 31, that biblical Barbie that's held up as the standard for Christian womanhood. This didn't die centuries ago with church fathers or even with reformers. Uh, the church I grew up in, frequently this, this lesson, if it was talked about at all, was presented as, you know, God searched to and fro throughout the whole earth and he couldn't find a man that he could use. And so reluctantly, maybe against his better judgment, God chose a woman named Deborah. And she stepped in there and she did her best and God supernaturally made it all work out. But don't be mistaken, this was never really the plan of God. You guys, you need to step up. You are supposed to be leading. The only thing about that is in this passage, there is not even a hint that in any way Deborah is plan B. She is all the way plan A. She is so much a model for both men and women for us to emulate. And so to reduce it as God reluctantly decided to put Deborah into the starting lineup that day because the go-to players just were on injured reserve. That's not what Scripture says. She was plan A, and she's a great example for all of us. Well, let's continue the story now in Judges 4, verse 6. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kedesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and give him into your hands. A prophet speaks for God, and that's what's going on here. Speaking for God, Deborah challenges Barak to lead an army to victory. Notice the wording is pretty careful. The battle's outcome is not in doubt, according to God. Well, what happens? Barak responds in verse 8. He said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. He has conditions. He'll agree, but only if those conditions are met. And Deborah, verse 9, says, certainly I will go with you, said Deborah, but because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kedesh. There Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went with him. Contrary to cultural expectations, Deborah warns Barak that a woman will receive the honor. There's a lot of conversation these days about the patriarchy, and some say that the scripture uh, perpetuates or even created the view that men are far superior, that women are subservient, that they exist to make a man's life easier. I, I don't believe that. I think it's real clear that patriarchy is not the teaching of Scripture, not the position of Scripture. It's its backdrop. And here we get a window into that culture. Deborah says, if, if this is how this happens, then, then I'm, I'm telling you, Barack, a woman is going to get the credit for this victory. Let's continue the story in verse 14. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is a day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harosheth Hagoim, and all Sisera's troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber, the Kenite. So Barak's army routs the Canaanites. I mean, it's a dramatic victory. They, they pursue them, and, and it says no one survived with one exception, Sisera, the leader, escapes. Where does he go? Well, he flees to where he believes that he will be safe. There was some kind of alliance, and, and he thought, all right, I'll, I'll be safe there. 
verse 21, there's a surprise waiting for him. After Jael serves him some milk and, and tucks him in and he's resting, says in verse 21, but Jael, Haber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. That's probably goes without saying. Just then Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. Though Barak pursued Sisera, he's killed by Jael, of all people, a woman. Just exactly as was predicted. I assumed Deborah was talking about herself, that a woman will get the credit, but now it's also shared with another woman, Jael. I'm sure you remember this story from your fourth grade Sunday school book. I mean, I no, actually not. This didn't make the cut. I, this might have held my attention as a fourth grader. You know, seeing Jael drive this tent peg in one side of his head and out the other, clear into the ground. I, I don't think there's a VeggieTales episode about Jael either. Funny, funny thing about that. There's so many things in the Bible. It's, it's a book full of stories that kids love. But you know what? A lot of these stories, we need to take a fresh look at them as adults because there's always a more complete view than the version that you learned if you had the blessing of growing up attending church. Now we turn to chapter 5, and this is kind of the epilogue of this story. I would encourage you, read the whole chapter. It's a, it's a beautiful song of praise, but we're just going to look at a few select verses uh, because those will summarize the point for us well. 5.1 says, On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song. When the princes in Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will praise the Lord, the God of Israel, in song. When you, Lord, went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook, the heavens poured, the clouds poured down water, the mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. Deborah and Barak, in this hymn of praise, they acknowledge the leaders. They celebrate the people, but humbly, they give glory, the ultimate glory, they give to God. This is so important. What, how do we know that that's true? Look at the details in that story. It's right there in your workbook in front of you. It, it says that it just rained. We say cats and dogs. This, this rained more than cats and dogs. This rain like donkeys and cows. I mean, it was a pouring storm. It, it's, it's thunderous. And why is that significant? Because the Canaanites had a huge tactical advantage. We read Jabin had chariots, not just any chariots, chariots that were lined with iron. We, we would call those tanks today. Now, they may have only been one horsepower, but for the time, that was a pretty formidable weapon. And the people of Israel had nothing to compete with that. But when it poured and poured and poured, and even when there's lightning, you take something that was a great asset, a huge advantage, all of a sudden, it's not just equalized. It becomes a liability in the mud, in the rain, in the lightning. That's just so cool. I had never really noticed that detail before. They say, great for the leaders, great for the people, but ultimately, God deserves the credit for this victory. This is such a great lesson for all of us. You know, it's real common for us to ask for God to help us before something, but it's rare to give him the credit after things go well. I mean, have you ever done this? You, I can remember having exams in school and going, oh Lord, you, you've got to help me with this. Please God, help me. Yes, reading the book, great idea. Paying better attention to class. Would, I'll do that next time, Lord, but I just need your help. 
And then remarkably, I'd come through there with an A and all of a sudden there's no mention of God. It's like, I got this teacher figured out. I knew what he was going to ask, she was going to ask before they even developed the exam. You all come to me next time because I got, I got her like, like in my pocket. I'm inside her head. Of course, I outgrew that like you did. Mm, ever do that before a job interview? Beg God for help. But then, oh man, I was so on that day. I mean, I made every major transition. I diffused any tension there would be about that hole in my resume. It was just, I, I nailed it. Or, or maybe a sales presentation. This is so special that Deborah and Barack don't just ask for help before the battle. They praise him after the battle. Well, let's continue the story in verse 7. It's written, it says, Villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose. Until I arose, a mother in Israel. Barak's role is mentioned, but it's Deborah who is emphasized. You don't see his name in this part of it. And she even underlines the fact that she's a woman. I, a mother in Israel. From the least likely source, according to their culture, comes this mighty warrior. The nation had been paralyzed and they're just, they're so passive, even the leaders, until Deborah took action by faith. I love the fact that in this lesson, we see God being a champion of a strong female leader. The bottom line is this passage teaches it, and you see this several other times in scripture, God elevates and empowers his daughters. God loves strong women. In fact, you know the only people threatened by strong women? Pretty much are weak men. That's just about how it goes. There was a church years ago, I never officially candidated there, but they were looking for a new pastor. And so I agreed to sit down with them and Ellen and some of the women were off. They said, our wives will take your wife shopping and see if her tastes would fit into this community. And, and so I sat down with this group of guys and I simply said, what are, what are some of the main things going on in your church? You seem frustrated that it's not growing. What do you think's wrong? What do you think the next pastor would need to do here? And they kind of looked at each other and finally one of them spoke up and, and he said, Phil, are you familiar with a ministry called BSF? And I said, like Bible Study Fellowship? And they go, yeah, I think that's what it's called. And before I could even say yes, my, my wife has been involved with it for, I don't know, four or five years in Atlanta. I think it's an excellent ministry. Before I could say any of that, they said, well, before we would even consider you as our pastor, we would need to know that if you come here, will you do your best to convince our wives that they should not be involved with this? And I, I said, why do you want to do that? And again, one of them kind of courageously spoke up and said, well, as guys, we're supposed to be the spiritual leaders, but how in the world are we ever going to do that if our wives know the Bible like twice as well as we do? And I said, you know, there is another option, guys. We could, we could just dig in. We could commit ourselves to, to growing and at that point, a couple of them just said, we don't, we don't have time for that. We got businesses to run. We've got families to lead. And looking back on it, I'm so thankful that God did not lead us to serve there. This idea that somehow men are stronger if we hold women back, that doesn't come out of this text. It absolutely, you can't support that when you look at the example of someone like Deborah. As we go to our time of discussion, again, there's, there's a question to get you started, one for women, one for men. Ladies, I'd love for you to answer this question, and the guys in your group need to hear how you respond to this. What are the barriers you face to experiencing God's elevation and empowerment? Don't use names. If it's your husband, don't run him down in a group setting. But be open and honest. How does it happen at work? 
How does it happen in church? How does it happen in your community? And men, the question for you is the complement of that. What will you do to raise up and encourage strong women? And especially, especially if you are a parent or a grandparent or you have a leadership role in church, in, in the youth ministry or with young kids, think about the fact that, that God has called us, just like he does, to elevate, to encourage, to empower, not just his sons, but his daughters. What's that look like in your world in tangible, specific terms? So ready? Go for it. And I can't wait to hear your feedback on the conversation that you share together. Thank you.